I'm just going to do another white water painting, similar to the one I did last time. What we do here is we do this, these webinars, and uh, what each, Peggy does hers, and I do mine. She's, she, hers are um, very lively. Mine are a little bit more academic. Pe Peggy covers all sorts of different art genres and um, does a wonderful job of, of explaining it in post and showing slides of historical, historically uh, significant painters and artists. And um, again, mine is more academic. And mostly I've been focusing on, on uh, landscape and seascapes. This, today, um, I'm going to be doing a, a one on, on foam. Here's a shot that I have here of La Jolla. It's actually a composite that I made of um, East uh, Shark Harbor's Catalina and La Jolla. And uh, I tried to make, the, um, tried to make the, the images match up. But I've got that on this, on this device here. It's, uh, you can see my finger there. It's, it's a live shot of my, my, other, of my main monitor, and I have it in Photoshop. A little bit about our classes. I've, I've got one coming up in June for it's all about water. It's going to be mostly about seascapes and stuff. And then Peggy's got another one coming up in, in June as well. Thank you for joining us today. I hope uh, I hope you all enjoy this. I hope uh, please feel free to ask any questions. We're here to answer them for you. And um, and Peggy will relay them to me. Or yeah, I've, we're going to try and get some live action. Yes, there we go. So. Uh, Mark, could you, um, I, I put together some slides I'd like to share with everybody if you'd like to see those. Uh, if you could get those started, that'd be, this would be a great time to do that. And there he is. That's the kind of work he does. Wonderful. I'll, uh, yeah, I know that woman. Yep. Uh-huh. Her too. Okay. Everybody knows this guy, Edgar Payne, one of my heroes. Um, one thing I like about this is that he's got two different values for the white water. He's got the splashing foam in light, and then he's got the foam in shadow. And he uses the same color for those foam striped bubbles dissipating, going back out to, to the ocean. And then he's got another value for the clear water. I, did, I covered this in one of my workshops this month, and it's just so striking how effective how separating the foam from the clear water in two separate values is in, in terms of communicating white water. Frederick Waugh, man, oh man, I tell you, he's, he's the premier uh, seascape artist. I just, again, he does the same thing. He, he separates, he's got about two or three really light values close together for the foam in light and for the clear water in, in light as well. Edward Pottis, yeah, I don't think he's known so much for his seascapes, but the, the, again, if you, if you use these, you use these tools for separating your clear water from your foam you, and you assign them to like different colors. You can, you can actually tone them down and make them more into night seascapes. And, um, and just as long as you have those value relationships and those color relationships, he's actually got about, he's got about three values right there in the water that he's using to communicate that, that with. And one is the light shimmering on the water. Another one is the foam and light. Um, and then there's the foam and shadow, and then then he has the um, different values for the clear water. But knowing how you can change those values around, you can create a day or a night scene and uh, have, do some wonderful mood pieces. Another Frederick Judois, again, he's he's got these uh, separated into simple values: um, the, the foam and shadow, and then he's got the shimmering light on the water, and he's, he's used these as graphic tools to describe how to separate this and communicate the, the subject that it is. Paul Doherty, he's a Calif he was a California painter. Again, he separated the uh, foam into white, into uh, white and light, and then shadow, shadow value. Another Paul Doherty. Um, I'm a sucker for shimmering light on water. It just, it done well, can be really mesmerizing and uh, just, just candy for the eyes for me. Oh, okay. I, I don't claim to be part of that group here, but I thought I'd throw in one of mine because I can. It's a lot easier for me to explain how, how I did it. And again, I have foam in shadow, foam in light, and then I've got the sunlight shimmering on the water. And uh, that's how I that's how I analyzed it when I painted it. And this was a um, painting I did a couple years ago in Laguna Beach on location. This slideshow just got really exciting. Oh. <laughs> 
Jeez. Okay. <laughs> Here, uh, here's the best part. Yeah. Now this, there will be a recording of this. I'll try to get it up on YouTube, but <clears throat> this is my palette. It's, it's a full range of colors. I, I like to have a full range of colors. I like to have all options ready for me for when I do these. Cat yellow medium, cat orange, cat red light, alizarin, doxaline purple, ultramarine blue, cobalt, cerulean, viridian, sap green, thalia yellow green, and a lot of white. I've got some sketches here that I've done in the past. Same approach, um, color coding uh, foam and shadow, foam and light, and then a little bit lighter for the highlight. And that that's generally the way I, I approach all my paintings. I just try to dissect it. I try to keep the values of the foam very light. These are samples. These are from, I painted from life. And these are, uh, I keep these. I haven't sold these. I, I try to keep them so that I, so that I can work from them, use this color in the studio. Because uh, when I get into the studio, for some reason, it, it just doesn't translate from the photographs. I can do all sorts of things to bring the color out, but it just never seems to replace the color that you can see when you're on location. So, might as well get started here. So I've, I've got 11 by 14 inch canvas here. I usually like to uh, start off with a, um, with a um, with a gray color, so I'm going to mix uh, just a, a neutral gray color to begin with, and um, just start mixing. How do you how do you get gray? You just start mixing colors, and believe me, it'll eventually become gray. Best advice. Best advice. Just just start mixing colors. Just start mixing colors. Yeah, in painting the object is mostly trying to avoid getting gray. So I got my pile here of neutral gray here and I'm starting off with a blank canvas. I'm gonna try and do this pretty quickly. Just so I don't bore everybody to death. Okay. Got this big splash here. You know, I. I thought about doing something else, but what better on a May day than to be at the ocean? Oh my gosh. It'd be a great day to be at the at the beach, wouldn't it? We're about 150 miles away from the ocean. Do you wish you were at the ocean, Peggy? Oh. God, I wish I was at the ocean. I'm getting, mm -hmm. I'm feeling confined. Confined. Are the walls closing in? Yes. <laughs> like a bad movie. <laughs> Let me just put a couple darker. Oh, yeah, I, I got it a little darker in there. It st started to look a little washed out. Light and shadow for all these grays. So if you all have had a chance, or if you hadn't had a chance, I guess the uh, California Art Club Gold Medal Show is on, it's on view. Um, I think if you go to their website, there's a, um, there's a, a few links there. You can you can see light, you can see uh, video recordings of the artists. Uh, that, that are part of the show, and you can also see the show itself. Light and shadow. It's a very academic approach. You know, one thing that I haven't shared too much in my workshops, but I'll, I'll try to remember to, to, um, to focus, to, to share, in them is that I, when I paint, sometimes I try to think of everything as like a marble cast. I try to take, I try to, to imagine it as an, as a, um, a sculpture, like an atelier sculpture and figure out what's in light, what's in shadow and what's its, its appropriate value. And, and not think of it as an object or a color, color representation. I think of it in terms of light and shadow. Does that make sense? Yes, that does make sense. Yes. 
Thanks. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to try and avoid any bad dad jokes here while I'm doing this. But sometimes there's no can. such thing as a bad dad joke. <laughs> Boy, is the internet so much better than the last time? Is it? Yikes. Yes. Is Facebook holding up pretty good. Yes. As far as I can see. Yeah. Everything looks great. Super. Speaking of, dad, speaking of dad jokes, Ray, you know that in about 15 minutes your time, it's going to be time to go to the dentist. <laughs> you know why? Oh, what? Dentist? The dentist, oh. yeah, because it's going to be 2.30. <laughs> -da <boom>. <laughs> I love it. You know, I still, I still get a lot of mileage out of that one, Mark. Yeah, that's... <laughs> Oh man, people are people are knocking my joke. No. That, hurts. <laughs> that that hurts. Oh. Come on, people lighten up, man. Tip your waitress. I'm here all week. <laughs> okay, I'm almost done figuring out where all my shadow shapes are. This is gonna be shadows on the rocks. This is gonna be shadow on the rocks. And now I did a demo last Monday where I painted my brightest color in first, but I don't have any very bright colors in this scene. So I'm going to start off with my uh, coloring my shadows first, which is my um, alter alternative approach to painting uh, landscapes. Hey, Ray, Dina has a really good question. She wants to know, as you're starting out, are you just blocking in light and shadow shapes and not really thinking about colors just yet? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dina. That's, um, I forgot to mention that. Yes. These are, I try to keep the color all neutral and grayish and I'm trying to paint just the shadow shapes first. That way I can look at it and not be distracted by this, by the color of it. I, I see it only in terms of light and shadow. Well, talk, and talk about how you, your dark light pattern, how you design with that. And I think you're, sometimes you design with your shadows, right? Or yes, yes, thank you. Yes. Um, when, I, when I talk about seeing it in the abstract, I'm looking at my, um, all sorts of things. I'm looking at the, um, the rhythm of the shapes. I'm looking at the size of the shapes, making sure I don't have any, anything that's too repetitive. I'm looking at the movement. And I'm also looking at the, the relationship of the overall light versus shadow. You I generally try to avoid having equal amounts of shadow and lights. And so I, I, um, I'm, I'm uh, multitasking here. I'm, I'm looking for, for uh, the rhythm of the piece. I'm looking for the amounts of the, of the shadow versus the light. And I'm looking for any kind of um, things that, that will, that will bug me like uh, tangencies or, or, uh, any of that stuff. And also, if I get this done done right here, it should start to take on form too. That's that's my primary concern. Oh, well, that's one of my primary concerns. Is that um, I get this I get the sense of form right off the bat. This is going to be my horizon here. Maybe throw in a few small clouds. I, you usually don't tone your canvas first, right? Not intentionally. Not intentionally. No, I prefer to try and keep my colors as light and bright as possible. But occasionally I'll, I might have to wipe it off and start over again. So that does happen. Then you're on a tone canvas. <laughs> and I, yes, then I'm on a tone canvas. There's some blue water. Well, I think I got my general shapes in. I've got my general plan in. Uh, I usually like to take a break and, and think about it for a while, but um, right now I think I'm just going to move forward here. I think I'm pretty close here. I like to start off with my uh, colorizing my shadow shapes. 
colorizing my shadow shapes so that I can uh, I can get any kind of atmosphere or atmospheric perspective, um, get the sense of reflected light and everything. If, if you paint all your shadow shapes first, that's how you establish your atmospheric perspective. And what is that atmospheric perspective you're talking about? That's the effect of uh, objects getting lighter and grayer as they go off in the distance, taking on the color of the, uh, of the atmosphere. If it was like a blue, like there in Colorado, you got those blue mountains off in the front range going off in the distance. Well, all the shadows start to get, take on the color of the, um, of the blue sky. If it was a red sunset, <clears throat> all the mountains in the distance would start to take on the color of, of the, of the uh, red sky. That's the effect of the atmosphere on the, on the, um, on the objects. Like when you're at the Grand Canyon and you can see for 70 miles looking down the river. One thing uh, about the coast is that it's, you know, you get some water and it splashes up and it starts to catch the, um, it starts to catch the atmosphere. The, the, it's really thick with the spray and stuff. And so I can, I can affect that in these shadows, that's where it's going to be no, most noticeable is, is um, the water, uh, water droplets picking it, catching up the sun. <clears throat> Peggy's last class is tomorrow, right? Yes, of this session. Of this session. Four Peggy, classes. your classes have been incredible. They, they've been so much fun. Oh, good. You probably are looking forward to a break. Yeah, I just need a little break, short little yep. break. I do a lot of prep work. So it takes me the week to kind of get ready for it. So did you guys find a dog sitter so you could get in that RV during your week off? <laughs> Oh gosh, not yet. Well, we're hoping our daughter and son-in-law will come up to the house and do it. Well, we've got a couple hundred people watching right now. Maybe somebody in the audience would like to uh, dog sit for Ray and Peggy. For use of a studio. Yeah, you could use a studio, a nice studio, well lit. Yes. <laughs> Won't have to wear um, PPEs. Wear what? PPEs. PPEs. Personal protective equipment. Oh, you mean like a mask? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, we're out in the boonies, but just when you go into the store or something. You're already practicing social isolation? <laughs> yeah. So even though this is uh, not too far away, just a stone's throw away here to these these rocks, it's still going to be a little heavier looking through the sun onto the ocean, uh, looking through the atmosphere. Hey Ray, can um, you share your painting medium again? Uh, yeah. Who needs some? <laughs> um, <laughs> Cascade painting. Um, no, what is it? It's yeah. Cascade is two or three. <laughs> it's one part stand oil, yeah, which is thicker. It's refined linseed oil, and then two or three parts. I get that mixed up, but I can't imagine it makes a, a uh, two or three parts um, thinner. Thinner. This is. I was. We learned this from a student. And it is the Emil Groupie medium hey peggy we can't quite hear you if it'd be nice if you'd shout shout right at ray see if okay. you can I, I have my thing this let's see is it on no it's not even on i don't think your mic is on yeah check 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 can you hear me there now it is. yep just got it there it is prestige worldwide yes check it check 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 so check. tell us again tell us again what's in that what's in that bottle Okay, paint thinner. It's it's uh, terpenoid or gamsol. 
that odorless, both are odorless. So it's one part stand oil, which is a refined linseed oil. So it's thicker. And then you, um, so it's one part of the stand oil and two or three parts, I, I think it's three parts uh, terpenoid or thinner. I mean, it, it can be either the terpenoid odorless thinner or the Gamsol. We, we really use Gamsol the, by Gamblin. So whatever your thinner is, um, and then we keep it in a little handy. I, I say it cleaned out one of a couple little plastic things and you can mix a thing of it and just, it's all ready. Hey, yeah, if someone wants to do the dogs, you don't have to sleep in the studio. You'll sleep in the house. Oh, I wasn't suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, someone said, can you sleep in the studio? We even have a house you can sleep in. Yeah. Instead. Hey, but before, let me scare you off. We've got five dogs to house sit. Right. Or to, but you know what? The Great Dane's the easiest one of all of them. Ray, oh. what's the advantage of that medium? Well, it kind of a, a ten, uh, extends the color a little bit, and it dries faster, and it just glides. It go, goes on nice, nicely. I, I haven't been and, using... And it retains the um, binding quality of the paint. Thank you. Did you get that, Mark? Yes. Yep, loud and clear. Yes, the binding quality of the paint, too. I... I kind of avoided the science part of all this stuff for, for the longest time. Just now started, or just more recently started using um, using a medium. I know, or used to use just the, the But you use medium. very little thinner anyway. Right. You've never used, it's just almost pure pigment. Hmm. Hey, let me mention to everyone, if you are watching this in Zoom on a tablet, you can actually zoom in, you can pinch, zoom to uh, get a better look at the canvas to get a better look at the the palette i'm not totally sure i know there's a way to do it on a laptop or desktop as well but uh, if you're on a phone particularly a an iphone or a, an ipad that if you you hopefully you guys know what that means to pinch zoom you know you put your two fingers together and then you, you squeeze them apart and you can zoom in what you can do um Command plus too for laptops and, and computers. Oh, thanks. I didn't know that. For Zoom, yeah. Okay, I mixed a big pile of light gray here. I'm gonna use this for my foam in light. Not not the highlights, not the specular highlights, but just mostly the foam in light here. Mix a little bit of this white orange with it. If it's in light, it's gonna have just a slightly yellow orange tint to it. I like uh, the sun being a kind of a warmish light. And a lot of people would just go ahead and paint the whole thing one color and then paint over it with a light color. I, I like to take my time and actually paint the colors butting up to each other. So if I had a really complicated scene here with a lot of small shadows in there, I'd still use the same approach. I wouldn't go ahead and block it in a big area of brown and then try and find the, the lights again. Do, 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 do. Of course, I don't think they, they paint much water inside of ateliers, but, and um, it's, it can be tricky, but, but the way I learned to paint water was painting it in the studio and then going out to the ocean and painting it in the studio and then, and then painting it in the ocean, going back and forth, uh, try to observe as much as I could when I was on vacation and then come back to the studio. And what I didn't see 
out on location, I would see in the studio. And what I didn't see in the studio, I would see out on location. It was just a process of going back and forth and learning what to look for, as well as learning how the um, historically great painters uh, approached, approached um, painting water. I hope you all are staying safe these days. It's um, quite a challenge. Looks like things are starting to open up a little bit. I got an email from Mark Fellman last night. Hi, Mark, if you're there, hi. I, he, he thinks things might be opening up. And we, could, we might be able to do a safe, safe distancing workshop on location sometime soon. Uh, yeah, why, why wouldn't we, why couldn't we um, go out and do on location workshops in this um, current, current situation? Anybody got any thoughts on that? Well, it seems like that might even be better if you can stay far enough apart, just being out in the sun and, you know, it's, it's good for your soul <laughs> on top of other things. But yeah, as long as everybody's not huddled in a tent together. Mm -hmm. Just have to watch the weather, right? Yeah, it's, it's better, but uh, Galen makes a good point. Hotel and flights, not a lot of people are wanting to do that yet. Oh, yeah. So I get it. I don't want to fly for, I don't want to fly right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I will now try to get the, um, let the rocks and light blocked in. Well, there's no way to fly to the Vermilion Cliffs. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I would, I, I would have no problem. I'd go, heck, I'm going to drive out in my Chrysler Town and Country minivan. <laughs> I'm going to make a bed in the back, take a cooler, and that's my hotel. There you go. With sleep with my paint equipment. And the dogs. Oh, we the so oh, somebody's coming. No, we're gonna get a house. <laughs> yeah, I guess I could. No, wait. We said each person would take a dog or babysit a dog while we did this, right? Everyone? Yeah. <laughs> we just need five volunteers, five artists volunteers on location. Someone said, "What color are you using now?" I am using um, a little bit of yellow and orange and a lot of white and some green on there just to um, gray it down gray it down so it's not quite so bright just to hit these whites hit these rocks in light and i might go with a little bit more red here these are pre-mixed piles or at least they were they started off um, with uh, white and orange and yellow yellow and white and cat red light and white. Those are, those are known as tints and it really helps for, for painting quickly and keeping those colors clean. Hey He's Ray, we've got some really good painters here. One of them, Mark Fellman. Hey Mark, we, we can hear you if you want to talk. You can. Well, you hey, know, Mark. I would love to hear from this group about, uh, you know, is there a place you might be interested in painting like Ojai or, you know, something north of LA a little bit. And, uh, you know, we'll organize it. You can get hotel rooms that uh, have been vacant for three days. So they're pretty safe. And we could be painting out, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere. That sounds great. That sounds great. I love Ojai. Do you know some good spots there to paint? I do. I oh. do, and someone like Dan Schultz could probably give us some real good clues too. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, there's also places uh, 
north of, say, um, Westlake Village that, uh, uh, you know, are real close that have fabulous uh, oak trees right now. Oak trees? Oak trees uh, oak. with golden hills behind them. <laughs> that sounds like Angel's Camp. <laughs> yeah, but it's not as far a drive for me. Oh, okay, yes. We have got oak trees galore up here. I would do more workshops up here, but it's kind of it's mostly um, ranch property and not a lot of with, without a lot of access. Although there's some stuff out by the lakes, I guess. Right, Peggy? Yeah, there's there's I think there's places, but you've painted it for so long, you're sort of seeing it with. It's hard to see it with fresh eyes again. Sometimes when you get a workshop, though, they, you know, new people can get you to see it in a fresh way. Yeah, you're right. But I guess it's too far away, isn't it? No, For we're on, we have. Uh, they could camp they right could camp. on. Oh yeah. <laughs> camp out. How am I doing on time? Okay, I got 20 more minutes left to do to try to get this done, get this blocked in. Get this started. Someone wants a water workshop in Santa Barbara. Ooh. Oh, but someone's how about a water one in Florida? <laughs> Just go from water to water, what? Ray. Uh-huh. Let's I love do it. it. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Okay, I'm on it. What blues are you using for the, your water? What were you using for your water? Uh, that was a little bit of Viridian and a little bit of green. Just kind of all smeared together until it looks right. Smeared? Smeared, yes. Um, until I got sort of a tur turquoise color that I see in my photograph. Let's see my photograph. That's weird how my brush goes behind that inset there. Kind of throws me. You've got about... 15 places now you're going to have workshops, Ray. Oh, is that Paso Robles, someplace in Canada. Then you're going to go to Florida. Okay. Then you're going to go to Ojai. Uh huh. Then Lake Louise. And uh, good. Uh, are these uh, personal workshops like one on one? No, these are would you, you would just a group, new group for everyone. A new group for everyone. You, yep. I love it. Thank you, guys. Come do the oceans of Denver. <laughs> <laughs> you got water parks, right? Yeah, we got we got, we've got waves of sorts. <laughs> and Dina said we have Casa Bonita. That's a total Colorado in joke, but yes. Oh, okay. That's a restaurant. It's no. Yeah, was it okay? I got it. <laughs> It's where all the surf bombs hang out, huh? Um, Ray, Ray, uh, Lynn wants to know when you put when you first put color down, are is it thin and then you go back building it thick when you've nailed the value? A little bit, yeah. Not, not too thin. I don't like it watery, but uh, just about the th texture of, of cream. And if it doesn't go down, I might I might add a little bit of thinner. I kind of made it a little my palette just a little more level so it wouldn't excuse me so it wouldn't run down down the edge of the palette. But I liked it to be able to go down easy and if if it starts to get a little thin I'll scrub it in there so I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of white canvas showing through. Okay. Now the thing about foam is that sometimes it's you, you get a little bit more blue in it, and sometimes you get a little bit more cream color in it, and sometimes you get that turquoise color in it. And to to really understand what's going on with it, is that is these are it's bubbles. It's a bunch of bubbles in uh, foam and water, and as it gets more denser, it's going to be more turquoise, like like you see on the face of a wave. Now, if it's if it's translucent, if it's a big big area of spray and light's coming through it, it's going to be a little bit warmer. 
if light's coming through with it, through it. Now, if it's in shadow, if it's more dense, if it's in shadow, it's going to get just a little bit uh, of the blue of the light from the blue sky, and that's going to make it just a little bit bluer. So, the trick is to analyze what your light source is, how dense is that foam, and to um, figure out what colors, why it's the color that it is in the shadow. Right, Peggy? Yes, I concur. Thank you. Uh, Donna Snowdale asks, what, Ray, what did you call that light? I'm going, that, that was a bit back. Durox, was it specular highlight, or you were talking about some light? Uh, yeah, the specular Dur highlights. Is, but hmm? she heard something else. I, I can't remember. Hmm. I'm going to guess that was the rocks in light. Oh, okay. As opposed to the rocks in light. But that's, oh, the rock. I, thank you. Of the course, the rocks in light. Which is kind of how you'd say it like Jamaican style, man. Oh, rocks. thank you, Mark. Man, you are, you should be one of those um, linguists. Hip hop rappers, I agree. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, translator guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'll answer that. Rocks. How'd you figure that out? Yeah. I told you, man, I'm like a, a closet rap star. <laughs> my, my daughter and I do ba battles all the time. I know how. We really? Do. Yeah. We should freestyle. One time we'll freestyle for you guys. Uh, church, yo. <laughs> Listen to us from dad jokes to whatever <laughs> this is we're doing now. No, I got that from Breaking Bad. Yeah, what was his name? Skinny? Was it Skinny? Oh, was it? I forget that one character's name. Oh, yeah. Okay, and some water in shadow. Ooh, this is going to be kind of fun to put on here. This is just right down the road from Mark Fillman's house. Just a wonderful place to, to paint. Um, he, he wanted me to share that you all are welcome to come by his house and stay for as long as you like and go <laughs> painting out with him. Oh, that's nice. That's Isn't great. That nice. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, no problem. No problem. <laughs> There's plenty of hotel rooms available. <laughs> I'd say we just all crowd into Mark's house. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see a great uh, collection of Ray Roberts paintings. Oh, I'm oh. sure. I'm sure. <laughs> and a great collection of Mark Feldman paintings. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how's the weather down there? I heard you guys are having it really rough there in San Diego. Oh, it is um, perfect today. It uh, is a, what I call a glorious day. Mm. A little tiny bit windy, but the sun is just pounding, and I would say it's about 76 degrees, maybe. Any more big, questions? Big heat wave there, huh? You got the, from 72 to 76, how do you guys tolerate that kind of temperature swing? It is really, really tough. That's I understand nuts. it's going to get a little warmer this week. <laughs> okay, Mike. Her, there is a question. Mike Hernandez is here. Hey, Mike. Ray, can you talk a little about how you control the design of color bodies in the painting for hierarchy? Color body. Well, this is yours. Mm, that's a. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, um, the, yeah, the, I got my dark shapes here, and I I try to. My my photograph isn't so isn't so hot. I'm sorry. I just, just turned it off. And... off. Hang on a second, folks. Oh, that didn't work. Hello. <laughs> Anybody want to buy some solar panels? <laughs> you, know, you know, you guys can just ask questions in the chat. You don't have to actually call Ray. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I've never, I, I'm not really familiar with the, um, think of it in terms of colored bodies. But um, 
uh, I've got I've got these dark shapes here, and I'm I'm trying to be uh, considerate of the atmosphere and the moisture in the air and the reflected light and all that stuff. So that would be I guess uh, one color body. Um, another one would was the foam, and then I've got the clear water, and then I've got the specular highlights and the shadow. So I've got those different shapes that I've I've kind of um, grouped made made groups of them. If that's if that's what you're referring to, I'd, I'd love to hear um, hear if that addresses your your question. Mike. Yeah, because he's an incredible designer. Yes, awesome paintings. Just always enjoy looking at your work, Mike. Yeah, here here, Mike's a great painter. You know, it's it's kind of hard to talk and paint at the same time, but and, and it's always difficult to come up with that something really striking and special about a painting in a scene, and and almost always it's it's by accident or staying at a at a spot for just that five minutes longer. You never know when it's going to hit you, and. As much as I try, you, you think that, oh why, my gosh, why can't I just invent it? But there's something about about getting it from life, about those happy accidents. Um, Mike, uh, he cl clarified his question a little more. Okay. And you've talked about this before. He said, uh, controlling where the eye goes, like first, second, third. Uh -huh. um, I see. Yeah, I um, one thing I I try to avoid doing is having my eye get stuck anywhere in a painting, and that'll happen with tangencies, uh, light and dark shift. Your your eye is going to go to wherever the most contrast is in in your painting, and uh, right now it's it's the shapes of these lights and darks here, and I um. I messed around with this photograph and tried putting a rock over here. And if you have two objects that are the same size, opposing on the canvas, it, your eye will start going like this ping pong. Or if you have another rock that that's butting up against another place with an awkward tangency, your eye will be your eye will be um, attracted to, to that static point. So <clears throat> I try to have things flow through a painting. It's it's. Uh, and and just avoid anything that that catches my eye and makes my eye stop. So you don't want your eye to go someplace first in the painting. I generally, you know, it a lot of times I will that will happen, but I don't I don't know that I have that much control. You don't I, think about it, or you don't. I um. I do think about it, but I I kind of put that wherever your eye is going to go, wherever you find your most interest. I try to find a strategic spot for that. That's not. Um, in the middle of the canvas this way or this way you know there's the golden sections i usually try to find someplace off center but um yeah what, what are your thoughts on that Peggy? oh well it's just you know it's kind of like what it's kind of like what's your focal point where do you want the eye to go first yeah. and then be able to move on from that then second then third right you know is that a real strategy for you yeah i try to you, again your eye is going to go to wherever the most contrast is and i try to do it or, or or the object is um whether or an object is like a a person or a um, animal or or a structure there's a there's also um, a hierarchy of elements in the painting that will grab your attention too like it's to be, if you're painting out in the desert and there's one cactus out there, your eye's going to go to that. Uh, right here, it could it's probably this way. If you're, I'm, I'm, I, I've got a lot of things coming up to it, and I try to make it as interesting. And uh, I, I think that would, you know, it is it a painting with a lot of content, or a painting, you know, you've got a floral somewhat in the center of the painting. Well, you know, you're going to go right to that or if you have a painting like a big scene mm -hmm. with a lot of content mm -hmm. um, do you want it to go I, I think there's just strategies by using the by using contrast and intense color to lead the eye mm -hmm. good question Mike <laughs> 
stump the teacher. <laughs> no, you, you. Uh, did I answer? I think you're just very um, intuitive with yeah, your design. Uh, intuitive, yeah. I'm, um, I'm a guy who, who likes to, to find the challenge in the painting, and figure out how to paint it. And, and, um, <laughs> so is it put a big red beach ball in the middle? <laughs> I like that idea. There you go. There you, go. you could put, put a bird in it. Can you put a bird in it? But hey, that's yeah, going to be one of our things. Put a bird in it. Yes. Pickle it. Class, Pickle it. <laughs> Class three is going to be uh, where to put your bird. And occasionally I will. Um, Bryce is here. Really? Yeah. Hey, Bryce. Natural bristles. Natural bristles. Yeah, I'm going to flatten this image. And I'm going to adjust it so I can see a little bit more contrast in those rocks. <clears throat> oh, look at that. I couldn't see that stuff before. That's the nice thing about having Photoshop or any other program. They, Photoshop Elements is, also works too, so it, it helps you bring out the detail. E even though, even if you don't want to paint, at least you want to be able to see it so that you can, you can include the subtleties of it. So Mike, do you still teach at Art Center? He's on the Facebook feed, so it'll take him a second to get that. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and I cannot see the Facebook feed. Oh, you can't? Nope. I thought you, you read that question, or did Mark? I, I'm seeing it in Zoom. Oh, okay. Cancel. Oh, Carol's got the, Carol's covering the Facebook feed, because I okay. can't see it. All right. I'm answering the chat questions and then we're all doing the panelist attendees i see super well is it starting to resemble anything <laughs> or do we lose our connection uh I'd say it looks like waves and rocks, Wait, if I had good. to guess. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So, um, I've got four classes coming up in June. Um, and they're all going to be mostly on water. One of them, one of them is going to be about... Um, addressing how to address your your paintings objectively or your water paintings and ray these are online classes correct these are just like this these are webinars uh with a very similar feed here uh you ask me questions i answer them while i'm painting i do the slideshows i do the uh i show some samples and i i try as best as i can to explain explain myself as I'm as I'm painting. Let me put in a little extra plug for that too. Ray's classes are incredible. If you are looking to learn compositional thoughts, color mixing, especially color mixing, and just watch a guy make great paintings right in front of you, Ray's classes are for you. And I think they're pretty affordable, right, Ray? I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, I do a, a HD version of them. I record it in a separate, a separate devices, and um, they're usually about an hour, an hour and a half long. And uh, they're they're um, available for ever. The access to them, you don't have to. You don't have to download them. You can stream them. And um, Carol sends out a. Uh, I gotta be careful how I put this. She she sends out a link 
to them. Yes, and you don't need a code or anything. See now this is this is troubling me right here. I got three things that are just really starting to bother me. And that's where my eye gets stuck. So I'm gonna try and stagger them. Maybe put a couple more rocks out here. Looks like I need to put a little bit more light, <clears throat> a little bit more light, warm light in the um, in the foam and the waves here. Mark Fellman has a question. Yes. Mark should ask it in person. Mark. So I I notice a lot that you use complementary colors adjacent to each other. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how to create some energy? Um, like the pink and the blue right next to each other? You know, I, I don't do that intentionally. I don't do that to create color harmonies. I do that because the objects, I see the objects as, a, as, a, as this color. It's kind of hard to see in my, in my monitor here, but there are some reds up here. So and you don't do that intentionally? No, I do not. I do not use color to create harmonies. I try to paint it as I see it, as it as it relates to every other color in my scene. And um, if it harmonizes, more power to it. He's a pretty simple guy, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> How about simultaneous contrast, Ray? Uh, yeah, I, now as I understand the simultaneous contrast is when you have two colors next to each other and they start to vibrate and that's because the values get very, it's like, um, it's like those 60s psychedelic posters where the, um, where they have very bright raw fluorescent colors. And when you put those two colors, if you have two very bright colors right next to each other and they're their same value, they will start to vibrate visually vibrate and that's what simultaneous contrast is and I could do a little bit of, the, of that in the sky to make the sky vibrate sometimes when you're out painting and you can't tell what a color what color an object is uh, sometimes it's just worth it to paint them um, all the different colors that you see it and that's what I will do occasionally in an area where I can't see where a color is see like I've got um, for the sky here I'm outdoors and I see, I can't tell if it's turquoise or pink or this. So yeah, Mark, Mark Feldman, this would be a situation where I might do a little trickery, but I don't know if you can see this, if the cameras can pick this up. Where you I, talked about that a little bit in your Monday Vermilion Cliffs class. Did I? Yeah. So if you have, um, Take two colors of the same value, different colors, and put them next to each other. Uh, you, you get what's called, um, what, what did you call this broken color too, Peggy? Yeah. Broken color. Broken color, like Monet. Yeah. Now here's another fun it's little so tip. That, that um, I, hope you, I hope you all are getting your money's worth on this. Uh, here's another little <laughs> tip. Uh, you can take a pile of pink like this and you can take like a green like this and, and Mark thanks for for the question too that, that's a really good question it helps me okay can I talk yeah can you hear me Ray yeah hey hey Peter how are you I've got some big news for you uh oh um, you know, the California Art Club for the last few years hasn't given out um, best painting in the show. You've won that, I think, three times more than any other artist. But um, this show was um, uh, tremendously high, high quality, and your work was very much loved and revered. And I know John Stern picked it out as one of the uh, works that he, he reviewed and loved it. And of course, it's a seascape of La Jolla. Um, but a beautiful piece. I just found out today that it, it won the only award that we give in the show, the Irvine Award from the Irvine Museum, and it's purchased by the California Club, so it's going in a great collection. 
So oh. congratulations, Ray. That's oh, applause, applause. applause. Wow. That's our biggest oh, award that we M -G -O. get. Oh, God. Thank you, Peter. God, no, I just found out about it two minutes ago. So congratulations, Ray. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. That's well, so you awesome. deserve it. Good job. That Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for being part of us. Oh, well, it's my honor. It's my honor. Okay, well, I'm done. <laughs> I'll see you guys. No. <laughs> Uh, hey Ray, I think we lost your microphone. So thanks for your patience, everyone. We were using tin cans and string just when we first started this, but technology has <laughs> come a long ways. Now we have really expensive tin cans and expensive strings. Yes. Well, I am just. Um, <laughs> wow. You're walking on clouds. Yeah. Over the moon. Uh, oh my gosh. I think he's going to cry. <laughs> <sighs> that's not rain, that's applause. Oh. Applause, applause here. Let's see if I can do a good one where they scream. Oh, everyone's wishing you congratulations mm -hmm. and happiness. Thank See? you so much. I I'd love. I wish I could spread it around. You know. You know what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a few little clouds. So those those fun little clouds in the sky here. Okay, how am I doing on time? Oh, I'm over time. I think you can just take your time, Ray. We're having a good take time. Take my time. So I'm thinking about, I got my specular highlights in there. A lot, to, a lot of times I'll take this, I'll take a painting like this and think about it for, for a long time and see what it, needs and maybe put some saran wrap over it and try try to do some changes to it and uh, that's quite an effective way of, of uh, fixing paintings is once it's dry enough just take some saran wrap and put it over it and try to do some changes yeah I see a little bit of transparency there you know there's some fun shapes that you get with these splashes where you can be really inventive I got that from looking at Winslow Homer's work he would he would have so much fun with these shapes, and I, I prefer the I prefer the solidness of a um, of a foam of a big splash like that as opposed to the taking the toothpick and splattering it on there. It's just something more that uh, uh, gives it more solidity. Now and also I don't try to to finish these up. <clears throat> live during the workshop. They're mostly lessons and demonstrations and, and uh, uh, sharing my thoughts when I, um, when I paint these and give you any kind, of, any kind of insights that I have about how to approach this stuff. But painting the water can be some of the most fun and rewarding things to do if, once you start to get the hang of it. And, but again, I had to go back and forth. I had to go uh, to the ocean to see what I needed to do in the studio. And then I had to go to, you know, and then stay in the studio to see what I had to look for when I did, when I, when I went to the ocean. And it's just a process of going back and forth and learning what to look for, how to see it, and how to communicate it. Yes, and you will post, you'll post this so people can see the, uh, you'll post this demo, right? Yeah, I'll post a very blurry version of it so you can't really, 
you can't pick it apart. <laughs> and then someone asked about before you uh, talking about your amazing award. You were talking about um, the sky and your broken color. There it is. Got it. Oh, was that a question, Peggy? Um, well, yeah, it was like yes, it was. Just maybe um, go back to that for a second. Uh, broken color. Yeah, how you, your sky has some broken color, and the way you mixed your pink and green on there on the same uh -huh. stroke. Uh, yeah, making the sky vibrate. Making the sky vibrate. Let me get a kind of a clean spot here. Broken color. That's so much fun. I got white. Okay. So, what you want to do is you want to mix two piles of uh, pretty clean color. And it's kind of hard to see because I'm, I'm making them so washed out, but I won't make them so washed out this time. <clears throat> so light. There's going to be my turquoise, and now I'm going to do a, a pink. I'll do a, a light, cad red, light, and white. What you want to do is you want to <clears throat> pick up a bunch of the cad red light on your brush and then pick up a bunch of the turquoise on your brush and go like that. And what it does is it doesn't thoroughly mix the color and it gives you broken color and it adds a little bit of iridescence. You see in like, like a seashell, a abalone seashell or <clears throat> that impression or that yeah or oil on water and stuff like that where it's not quite you get all those different colors <clears throat> you get the simultaneous contrast of one color next to another and that it's not thoroughly mixed and it just adds a little interest to it and it also <clears throat> when you stand back it kind of they kind of neutralize each other and you just see the general gray that it makes rather than the individual pinks and greens and uh, that's that's a very effective tool if you want to create more vibration in your paintings in certain areas. And um, it also, also adds interest for the people who like to look at, like to get close and, and really dissect a painting. How does that, did I explain that? Yeah. To um, satisfaction, to everybody's satisfaction. What time is it? It's ten after three. I've, I've, um, I've, I've gotten pretty much all the, all the points that I wanted to get across and shared most of the, of the um, thoughts I had on this. I hope you can you can join us for these these workshops. They're, they're a lot of fun. The, the Facebook group pages have, have been fun too. Uh, a lot of people have been posting some really great paintings. Um, I, I've been able to, to help a little bit with some of them. Some of them are just fine. <laughs> and um, let's see, this last, last three ones, one was uh, the seascape with the um, white foam. And then there was one that we did spring creeks. We did creek scenes and, and talked about reflections and how you can see through water, stuff like that. I used a sergeant for an example on that. And then uh, there was the last one, which was a Vermilion Cliffs. Oh, panic painting, right? Yeah, panic that's going to be a class. Yes, that uh, where, where, you know, you're trying to paint sunrises in just 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, yes, that's what we called it. We called it panic painting, getting that, uh, getting that light in that just the last seconds. And a lot of it has, uh, you have to have uh, these premixed piles of color to get the color in quickly. Okay, that's about as much as I need to talk for the next two weeks. I usually don't talk very much. Any more thoughts? Any more questions? I think I'm just about done with this. What a great painting, Ray. I, I say this every time, but I'll do it one more time. Ray has this incredible skill of moving from very generalized value relationship type shapes into uh, smaller and smaller details and then his little he calls them specular highlights I'm sure someone else calls them that too but those tiny little sparkles uh, and I can't think of anyone who does that better it's just it's such a great design tool that you're using and it makes your paintings just sing thank you Mark 
Well, they're, they're fun to do. This is one of my favorite subject matters. Uh, one of the classes that I'm going to do is the uh, shimmery, shimmery, water, shimmery light on water uh, coming up in June, where you're looking and the sun's up high and it's behind it, and maybe it's partly cloudy, and you get those little those little sparkles, those specular highlights on top of the top of the water, like these here. Yeah, that's just a lot of fun to paint. So I, I think I'm done here. Yeah, that was um, fantastic. Super. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining me. And um, I'll try to respond to your comments or questions on, on Facebook. And um, I, I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Peggy.